Anybody in here been saved longer than 30 seconds? Okay. This, this may be hard for you to remember if you've been saved longer than 30 seconds. But does anybody ever, anybody here ever been to a party or a club? Okay. Okay. Now, at a party or a club, interesting dynamics would happen because you would kind of hold the wall up, kind of socialize, maybe hang out at the punch bowl until the DJ played your song. And when the DJ played your song, all bets were off. You had to get in the middle of the dance floor and do your thing. Even if you couldn't dance, you did the best you could because your song was playing. And I don't know about you, but I have that phenomenon happen to me every Sunday. There is a song in every worship set that the praise and worship team does. I love every song they sing, but there's always a song in the set, whether it's the front three or the one before preaching time, that I just say, that's my song. Well, I got to tell y'all, y'all, last week they did that to me so much. They played my song. In the Room by Maverick City and Tasha Cobbs, y'all, that is my song. If you're ever beside me in traffic and wondering, am I talking to myself? No, I'm singing my song. And, and, and they just sang that song so much. This song has been in my spirit all week long because it was talking about what happens when we get into the room with God. And, and, and you know, sometimes Dr. Denise and I will hang out with other married couples. And, you know, there's always that married couple. Pastor Josh, Lady Kenya, you know about this. There's always is that married couple in the bunch that obviously they haven't seen each other for a while because their PDA is more intense than the PDA of the other couples. Anybody ever know that? I mean, their, their PDA is at an all-time high, like they're still in high school. And, and, and what will often happen is that the other couples at the table will glance at them and say jokingly, y'all need to get a room. <laughs> Because, because what is happening is that your love for one another is about to bubble over here in this restaurant in a way that is inappropriate. <laughs> so y'all need to go and find yourselves a room. But how many of you know, just like married couples need time together in their room, so do the saints of God need time alone with the, in the room with God. Because is there anybody here who knows that great things occur when we go into the room with God. Is there anybody here who's ever taken some time to go into the room with God? And on this morning, I want to talk about hopefully five different rooms that we need to go into with God. The first room is your room. The second room is the family room. The third room is a locked room. The fourth room is a private room. And the fifth room is a recovery room. So let's see if we can begin to unpack this. Let's look at your room. Tell somebody your room. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 and 8, it says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. That tells me a couple of things, that my room must be a place that is conducive to the presence of the Most High God. Oh, y'all missed that. that. That means that I can have to make sure that my room is always in sanctuary-like conditions so that it's a place where God is pleased to allow His Spirit to come and dwell. It says, but when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Is there anybody here other than me who has seen God reward private prayers in public places? He says, and when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, because guess what? Your father knows what you need before you even ask him. And in other words, what this text is saying to me, Pastor Joshua, is that, beloved, you and I cannot be quick to pray in public. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't be quick to pray in public. That means at Thanksgiving. That means at the family reunion. You can't be quick to pray in public if you're not as quick to pray in private. Are y'all with me? Notice in verse 8, Jesus says, do not keep on babbling like pagans, restating our prayers repeatedly. So if God knows what you need, look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to keep talking about it. The fruit of prayer is not just us asking God what we need, but the fruit of prayer is the privilege of being in God's presence. 
Somebody missed that. The fruit of prayer is the privilege of being in God's presence. And I'm, mm, this is going to mess somebody up. Beloved, I have discovered out of my own life that you can cut your drama quotient by more than half if you keep your prayer life consistent. Sometimes God has to allow our drama and drama to come into our lives because that's the only way that many of us will pray to him. Oh, y'all don't like me no more. Because when we're going through trauma and drama, isn't it amazing we always have time to pray? But when the ends are meeting and everything is on and popping, it's just a quick thank you, Father, and we're on our way. Ooh, I didn't think it was going to be that quiet. The fruit of prayer is that you and I get the opportunity to spend time on earth in the presence of our Heavenly Father. But what Pastor Joshua said in prayer this morning just blew my mind. He said, if you're praying, look around. God's not far away. Because if we're already seated with Christ in heavenly places, then that means Christ is right there. Look at your neighbor and say, look around, look around. Intimacy, tell somebody, intimacy is revealing. For, for, for married couples, you know this. For soon-to-be married couples, you will learn this. There are things that spouses know about one another that no other human being on earth knows about that individual. It's the same with the intimacy that we share with our Father in prayer. He says in Jeremiah 33 and 3 that when you call on me, I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things that you did not know. It reminds me of the story of Daniel. Daniel was appointed leader over all the governors in Babylon. And the governors in Babylon were so jealous of Daniel that they called TMZ to dig up some dirt on Daniel. And TMZ bought their cameras and TMZ brought their microphones and TMZ followed Daniel around, but the only thing that they could find was that Daniel was a praying man. And so they understood that the only way they could get at Daniel was by attacking him at the source. So they came up with a bogus degree about prayer. Now before I go another further, beloved, that's why you and I have to be very prayerful about the opportunities that we consider good opportunities. Mm. Thank those eight people. Thank you so much. Because if an opportunity takes you away from your service to the Most High God, it may not be an opportunity that God sent your way. If an opportunity keeps you from praying, if an opportunity keeps you from worship, if an opportunity keeps you from serving, then maybe that opportunity didn't come from God. Because every good and perfect gift cometh from the Father. The blessings of the Lord do not bring sorrow. Keep on preaching, Pastor Blow. I believe I will. The Bible says in Daniel 6 and 10 that they made this setup for Daniel. It says, but Daniel, when he learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he did before. In the King James, it says it like this. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day to pray prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom. In other words, Daniel said, the God who got me this position is the God who's going to keep me in this position and I'm not going to compromise my values in God in order just to keep a position. So Daniel goes up to his upper room. Tell somebody your room. Daniel goes into his upper room and he begins to pray. Daniel understood that Jehovah still has the final say. He understood that Proverbs 21 and 1 says that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the river of water he turns it wherever he wishes this is why God is still king of kings and he's still lord of lords and you and I can see things change when we spend time with the almighty God in our room tell your neighbor spend time with God in your room and you will see things change Daniel went to his room as usual in other words Daniel was already in the habit of praying to God three times a day so he was not going to let anything break his holy habit elbow some Somebody say, don't allow anything to break your holy habit. And the Bible says, the Bible says that Daniel ended up in the lion's den. 
He got thrown into the lions. And the Bible says when Daniel knew that the writing was home, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and give thanks to God because it was his custom. It was his habit. Praying and giving thanks should be what we do. Is there anybody here who's committed to praying and giving thanks to God at least three times a day? Tell somebody, that is what I do. Is there anybody here who has a habit of prayer, who has a habit of giving thanks? Is there anybody here who's in a place now that whenever something good happens to you, you still got to give God glory. You still got to give God praise. And we begin, we've gotten to the place where we can say thank you for the little stuff. I now understand how those old mothers used to pray. They would sit in the front of the church and they would say, first giving honor to God, to the pastor, saints, and friends. I thank God that he allowed my golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. Is there anybody here who can thank God that you're even still alive? So look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. It says these men went in a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. If somebody follows you home, will they find that you pray? If somebody follows you and me home, will they find that we are the same saint of God on Sunday as we are on Wednesday? Ooh, ooh, mm, it's getting quiet in here. These men went in a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. When you and I pray, beloved, God will send help. Praying in your room brings angelic assistance. Daniel says in Daniel chapter 9, verses 21 through 23, as I was praying, Gabriel, who I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, the angel showed up and he says, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven and I have come in answer to your prayer. So these men go to the king. They spoke to him about his royal decree because God was moving on the heart of the king. God was turning the heart of the king and they said, but your majesty, you cannot revoke this decree because the commands of the Medes and the Persians are irreversible. Is there anybody here who knows that we serve a God who can reverse the irreversible? You see, sometimes we don't need to pray for God to keep us out of the fire. We don't need to pray for God to keep us out of the lion's mouth, but we just need to pray for God to be with us in what we go through because the the bigger testimony is not God keeping us out of. The bigger testimony is God bringing us through. Is there anybody here other than me who has a God brought me through testimony? Is there anybody here who's been through enough stuff that you say, if it had not been for the good hand of God on my life, where would I be right now? I need somebody to just throw your hand up and declare, I've got a God brought me through testimony. The enemy had plotted and planned for you to be destroyed. But is there anybody here who can look down to hell and say, I'm still here. I'm still here. I am still here. So look at this, Daniel chapter 6, verse 19. It says, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. He said, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king leave forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lion. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in God's sight. Nor have I done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he trusted his God. Look at your neighbor and say, there's no wound on you because you trusted your God. Is there anybody here who is amazed that you still have your right mind? Is there anybody here who is amazed that you're not more injured by the things that you've been through? It's because the good hand of the Most High God continues to be on your life. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Now, let me tell y'all this. Daniel did not get victory over the lions in the den on the day he was thrown into the den. Let me say that again. Daniel did not get victory over the lions on the day that he was thrown into the den. Daniel got victory over the lions in the lion's den when he decided to continue to go to the room and pray. When he decided to continue to give thanks to God three times per day. Daniel's victory occurred in the room. I need somebody to know that because you do not know what next week, next month, or next year is going to bring, prayer puts your victory on layaway. 
away. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. Prayer puts your victory on layaway. Is there anybody here who knows that when you pray, God hears and God answers prayer? If I'm talking to you, shout hallelujah. Look at your name and say, that's why you have to spend some time with God in, his, in your room. Isn't it amazing? We can spend time with Facebook in the room. We can spend time with Instagram in the room. We can spend time with TikTok in the room. We can spend time on our cell phones in our room. But isn't it amazing that we rush through prayer? Hello in here, somebody. Hello in here, somebody. We have to make prayer a priority. Beloved, for what's coming, God is trying to get the saints into a habit of prayer. Woo, y'all don't like me no more. The, the River of Life probably combined membership for both campuses is probably over 1,500 people. Noonday prayer, we get about 28 people logged in. Thank you, thank, thank you, Sister John. I'm just saying. Look at them and say, I'm just saying. Y'all, we have to make prayer a priority. What if we were as addicted to prayer as we are to Instagram? What if we were addicted to prayer as we are to Facebook? What if we were addicted to prayer as we are to texting and talking with our homies and our homegirls every day? What if, tell your neighbor, I got to have a habit of prayer. Saints are going down for the count because saints aren't praying. But look at your neighbor and say, you don't even have to go to volunteer training in order to pray. <laughs> Woo. Daniel comes, out the, Daniel comes out of the fire, comes out of the lion's den. The King Darius published a proclamation to every race, color, or creed on earth. He says, peace to you, abundant peace. I decree that Daniel's God shall be worshipped and feared in all parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never fails. His kingdom never fails. He rules continuously, eternally. He is a savior, a rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Look at your neighbor and say, Mm, no, don't say this. I, I, I don't want you to say this. I need somebody to understand that in this season, one of our favorite cliches is miracles, signs, and wonders. But the problem with saying that is that we want to hog all the miracles, signs, and wonders for ourselves. God wants us through prayer to be a part of the miracles, signs, and wonders that bring other people to God. You see, we want all the miracles, signs, and wonders for ourselves. But is there anybody here who wants miracles, signs, and wonders to flow through you so that other people can come to know that that God is not a God to be played with, that God still sits high and he still looks low. If I'm talking to you, shout hallelujah. So the first room is your room. Somebody say your room. The, the next room is the family room. Tell somebody the family room. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, when Jesus went to Peter's house, he saw that Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a fever. Understand, beloved, there are a lot of saints who walk closely with Jesus who are dealing with a lot at home. Hello in here. Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed. Imagine that you are Peter and being close to Jesus and still having close, someone close to you who does not serve Jesus. Is there anybody here just praying that God would save somebody in your family so that they could serve Jesus? So, so Peter has this same prayer. But look at this. When you and I bring Jesus into the room, it revolutionizes relationship. The fever had Peter's mother-in-law pinned down. Now understand that any medical doctor will tell you this. A fever is an outward sign of an internal fight. Mm, Y'all missed that. A fever is an outward sign of an internal fight. Sometimes it can be multiple fights going on at the same time. I don't know who this is for, but I feel that God wants me to tell somebody that the almighty God is about to step into some family rooms and break some fevers in some families. Is there anybody here who has some fevers in your family? You need to give God a praise right there because God asked me to tell you that he's stepping into your family room and he's going to break break some fevers in your family. You don't know why the fever's there, but God's going to break the fever. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Elbows to your neighbor, say some fever's about to get broke in your family. 
The Bible says in verse 15 that Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her. Then she stood up and began to serve Jesus. Verse 15, my, my wife likes to order loaded baked potatoes. Verse 15 is like a loaded baked potato. The first thing, Jesus touched her hand and the fever left. When Jesus is in the room, whatever is keeping you down must release you. Let me say that again. When Jesus is in the room, whatever is keeping you down must release you. That's why if you have some family members that are tall, tied down. Sometimes you got to walk through the house when nobody is at home. Sometimes you got to lay hands on your children's pillow. Sometimes you got to go in the garage and pray over their cars. Sometimes you got to do, sometimes you got to go to the other relative's house and just walk around their house before you knock on the door. Because when Jesus comes into the room, whatever has you pinned down must release you. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. That's why the Bible says in Acts, death had to let him go because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. Understand, beloved, whatever has your family members in the grip, it has to let go when you bring Jesus into the family room. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Ooh, I got some, I hope it's good advice for somebody. This year, invite them to your house for Thanksgiving. I know you're saying, Pastor Blow, you don't know my family. <laughs> Listen, if you shake all of our family trees, some nuts going to fall out. <laughs> Amen. And depending on who's telling the story, we might be one of the nuts. <laughs> but invite all of them over there. Uncle Halfhead, Uncle Skivvy, Cousin Skeeter. Invite all of them over there. But the week before they come, you just saturate that environment with prayer. You saturate that environment with praise. You saturate that environment with the praise and worship of the Almighty God. You pray over that food. You pray over every seat. And even when they get there, even though the football game is on, you have some worship music playing lightly under the football game. And you watch God move. We have had, Dr. Nina can tell you, we have had, when we lived in Columbia, most of our family now lives in the D.C. area. When we lived in Columbia, Maryland, we used to have revival break out at our Christmas Eve party. Tell somebody it can happen in your house. So look at this. When Jesus came in the room, Peter's mother-in-law got total victory, and she stood up and began to serve Jesus. By the time Jesus lives our, leaves our family room, our whole families will decide to serve him. But not only that, when Jesus is in the room, everything, ooh, I love this. This not goes on for Peter, but also for his mother-in-law, for each and every one of us. When Jesus is in the room, Everything that has impaired our ability to serve Jesus must release us. Hello, and here's somebody. Somebody missed a great place to shout. Is there anybody here who has some things, both known and unknown, that are impairing you from praising and worshiping, serving God at the level that you want to? If you're here, just lift your hands because I want to speak a word over your life that everything that is impairing you from serving God like you want to serve him, for praising God like you want to praise him, for worshiping God like you want to worship him. Everything that is impairing you from growing in your relationship with Christ is snapped now in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, I better wear my tennis shoes next week. Because I've been wanting to get up there and dance with mother. But next Sunday is the Sunday I'm going to do it. Because everything that has impaired your ability to worship and praise Jesus, it must release you. But look at this. God does such a great work in Peter's family room. That word gets out that Jesus is in the room. And the entire neighborhood decides to head over to Peter's house. The Bible says they were watching the football game. They were cleaning up the dishes. They were putting everything up. And all of a sudden, it was a knock on the door. And it was everybody from the cul-de-sac. It was everybody from down the block. That evening, people brought to Jesus many who had demons. And look at this. Jesus spoke to the demons, and they left. Look at your neighbor. Say, you don't have to negotiate with a demon. If you speak to a demon under the authority of the Most High, 
my God, that demon has to flee. And he healed the sick. He did these to bring about what Isaiah the prophet had said. He took our suffering on him and carried our diseases. Understand, beloved, our family room is not just where you come to watch the game. It's not just where you come to play cards. But our family room is where healing and wholeness happen. If I was one of the singers, I would say, oh, 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 he's in the room. Tell somebody he's in the room. But not only that, tell somebody a locked room. Nothing can keep Jesus out. The Bible says in John chapter 20, verses 26 through 31, eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through locked doors, stood among them, and said, peace to you. Let me give you a little background on this text. Jesus had shown up after the resurrection. The disciples were there, but Thomas was out doing something else. So he missed seeing the resurrected Christ. And they told him that Jesus had shown up. And he said, unless I see him, and unless I can put my hands in his hands, I will not believe it. So eight days Days later, the door is locked. Tell somebody, the door is locked. Please know for sure, beloved, that there is no lock or other device strong enough to keep Jesus from coming to see about you or me. And let me say that again. There is no lock. There is no security system. There is no army that is strong enough or bad enough to keep Jesus from coming to see about you. In a locked room, Jesus is showing up for you exclusively. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is coming. Coming into my locked room. There are some of us who have some rooms that we won't allow other people to come into. There are some of us who have places in our life that we haven't told anybody about. But let me tell you something. Jesus is coming into the locked room of every hurt. Jesus is coming to the locked room of every disappointment. Jesus is coming to the locked room of every setback. And he's not coming to deal with anybody else, but he's coming to focus on you. How you know that, blow? Because verse 27 says, he focused his attention on Thomas. Somebody lift your hands and say, Father, focus your attention on me. Somebody say it again. Say, Father, focus your attention on me. There's a song that the praise and worship team sings. It says, and guess what? God is so much God that even while he's dealing with other people, he still makes time for you. Is there anybody here who's a witness that with all the things on God's plate, he is such a great God that he still makes time for you. I need some Somebody to wave your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Somebody shout, he still makes time for me. So look at this, look at this. He said, Thomas, take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, just believe. Mm, thank you, Father. I need to help somebody understand. God can deal with our unbelief. Let me say it again. God can deal with our unbelief as long as you and I are honest about our unbelief. Are y'all with me? Jesus said, so you believe, you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs that are written down in this book. I love this verse. Jesus provided far more, far more God-revealing signs that are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally believed it, revealed it. Jesus provided far more more God revealing signs than are written down in this book. I need somebody to know that in a locked room Jesus will show you and me stuff about him that is beyond the book. Is there anybody here who's seen God do a beyond the book work in your life? Is there anybody here who's seen God do something that you should have a book in the Bible named after you? Is there anybody here who's believing God for a beyond the book experience? If you're believing God for a beyond the book experience I need somebody to shout hallelujah. hallelujah but wait a minute there's another room tell somebody a private room look at this the message second Kings chapter 9 verses 1 through 3 it says one day Elisha the prophet, Elisha the prophet represents the power of God. The Elisha the prophet ordered a member of the guild of the prophets, get yourself ready, take a flask of oil, and go to Ramoth Gilead. Look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. When you find him, look at what it says, when you find him, get him away from his companions. Somebody missed that. When you find him, get him away 
from his companions. In other words, sometimes in a private room, those with low expectations about what God can do in and through and for you, God has to dismiss those people in order that you and I can walk into everything that God has for us. There are some rooms in your life, beloved, that everybody can't go into. He says when you find him, get him away from his companions and take him to a back room. Take your flask of oil and pour it over his head and say God's word. I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and get out of there as fast as you can. Don't wait around. The first thing that Elisha told the prophet to do when he found Jehu was to get him away from his companions. Beloved, environment makes a difference. Tell your neighbor, environment makes a difference. Beloved, every now and then, you've got to get away from certain companions. Jesus, the son of the living God, could not do many miracles in his own town. Never forget that. So look at this, look at this. Some of us will never step fully, brilliantly, and completely into that which God has for us until we get away from certain companions. Now look at this. This prophet was sent to Jehu to anoint him, to anoint him with oil. Now never miss this, beloved. Some people in our lives are just transitional people. Some people are sent into our lives temporarily in order to move us into the anointing and purpose that God has for us. Hello in here. Let me say that again. Some people are sent into our lives temporarily in order to move us into the anointing and purpose that God has for us. And after they've done that, they're going to run out of your life. You don't have to feel dismissed. You don't have to feel ghosted. You understand that God sent them on assignment and after their assignment was over, now that you're in the place that God wants you to be. Give God glory. The prophet found Jehu and took him to a back room and anointed him king over Israel. After the prophet did this, he opened the door and ran, but not before he put Jehu in the room to receive the royal anointing. God wants to put you in a private room because he has a private assignment on your life. Everybody can't handle the calling that God has placed on your life. Hello in here. Everybody can't deal with it. Some people have to see it after the fact. That's, oh, 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 this is off the subject. That's why some testimony we can't testify about until they've come to full and complete manifestation. You can't testify about everything while it's in progress because you put too much demonic activity on the line. You have to wait until God has fulfilled that thing, then testify about God how God brought you through it. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And push this thing along. Mark chapter 5, verse 37 through 43. Very familiar passage of scripture. It's about Jairus and his daughter. Y'all, some of you may know this story. For those of you who don't, uh, there's this man named Jairus. His daughter was sick. She was 12 years old. He goes to Jesus. He says, can you heal my daughter? Jesus is on his way to his house. This woman who had been afflicted with this issue of blood. How many of us got some issues? This woman with this issue touched him, and her issue was, was healed. Jesus said, who touched me? She confesses that he touched me. She said, daughter, go and be healed. And she's healed, and she's whole. And somebody sends Jairus a text message. Somebody from his house, somebody from his house who knew that he went to go see Jesus, sends him a text message to sow doubt in his mind. Somebody from his house, one of his companions, sends him a text message and says, why bother the teacher anymore? Your daughter has died. Why you send me that text? You know I'm coming here believing Jesus for something greater. So why do you send a text now that sows doubt into my spirit? The Bible says, but Jesus overheard it. And Jesus says, stop doubting and just believe. Look at your neighbor and say, he's working it out. Tell your neighbor he's working out his purposes. As a matter of fact, encourage your neighbor. Say, neighbor, no matter what text message, no matter what Instagram, no matter what you get this week, do not let that make you doubt what God has said. Is there anybody here who believes that his promise still stands? Now, I may have to go through a process, but his promise still stands. Let me say that again. I may have to go through a process, but his promise still stands. Is there anybody here who believes that? Are you, tell your you may have to go through a process, but his promise still stands. So look at this. Look at this. Mark chapter 5, verse 37. So they get to the house. Look at this. He permitted no one to go in with him except Peter, James, and John. Jesus couldn't even allow some of his disciples to go into this house. 
You have to know, beloved, who in your life can handle what. They entered the leader's house and they pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story because some people are just out there because they're just trying to put, find a story. Because a dog that carries a bone will bring a bone. Their neighbors bringing in casseroles. Jesus was abrupt. He said, why all this busybody grief and gossip? This child is not dead. She's only sleeping. Provoked to sarcasm, they told him that he didn't know what he was talking about. Now, that's a good place for somebody. Now, if they told Jesus he didn't know what he was talking about, understand sometimes people are going to tell you that you don't know what you're talking about. But look what Jesus did. The Bible says Jesus cleared out everyone who was negatively impacting this move of God. I need somebody to know that you need to get ready for your room to be cleared out. Elbow somebody say, get ready for your room to be cleared out. God is clearing out your room. The Bible says in verse 40, but when he sent them all out, he took the child's father and mother along with his companions and entered the child's room. He clasped the girl's hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. At that, she was up and walking around. The girl was 12 years of age. 12 is the number of divine order and government. God wants to bring his divine order and government to every room in your life. Is there anybody here who can lift your hands and say, Father... I'm ready for you to bring divine order and government to every room in my life. Is there anybody here who's had your life be a mess, who's had your life be upside down, who's had your life be twisted and turned, but you've watched gradually as God has turned that thing around and God has fixed that thing? Am I talking to anybody here who's seen God do a great and an awesome work in your life? If I'm talking to you, I need you to lift your hands and say, God, I thank you for coming in to my room. I thank you for making ways. I thank you for opening doors. Somebody shout, thank you God for being in the room. But look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, we got one more room. Tell your neighbor side. Say, neighbor, we got one more room. Anybody remember the rooms we've been into? Anybody remember the rooms we've been into so far? Anybody remember the rooms? Anybody remember? Go ahead, shout it out, Kelly. Which, what rooms we got? Say that again. My room, family room, my room, family room, oh, with lock room. Let's call them out again. Let's call them out again. My room, one more time. All right, so God has been in four rooms of our life. And as he's come into those four rooms of our life, he has done a great work in our lives. Is there anybody here who's seen God do some great work in the rooms of your life? Is there anybody here who can honestly admit that the only reason I'm sitting here today clothed and in my right mind is because God has done a great work in some rooms of my life? Is there anybody here who can say, God, thank you for the work you've done in the room? Is there anybody here who can say, thank you, God, for the work that you've done in the room? Is there anybody here who would have ended it all if God hadn't done a work in your room? Is there anybody here who would be Baker acted if God hadn't done a work? in your room? Is there anybody here who knows that you are who you are and you have what you have because God has done a work in your room? I need somebody to lift your hands and declare he's in the room. Tell somebody he's in the room. Tell somebody he's in the room. But can I tell you about this last room? Elbow your neighbor say, neighbor, this is the room that I'm in right now. Look at your neighbor say, what is the last room? Somebody say, it's the recovery room. Is there anybody here who knows that God will recover the years that the locusts have eaten? That God will recover the years that the cattle worms have eaten up? The Bible says that he clasped the girl's hand and he said, Talutha Kakum, which means little girl, get up. I've come to tell you that when God puts Put you into the recovery room. You can get back up again. Is there anybody here who's ready to get back up again? Is there anybody here who believes that your best days and your blessed days are not behind you, but your best days and your blessed days are still in front of you? I need you to touch three people and tell them, get up, get up, get up. Tell somebody, get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up, get up. 
get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Wherever you've been, whatever you've dealt with, tell somebody, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Somebody lift your hand and say, Jesus is taking you by the hand. And he's saying, get up and walk in your recovery. Get up and walk into the great things that God has for you. Is there anybody here who can give God the praise? Is there anybody here who can give God the glory that you have walked into your recovery season? Somebody, anybody, everybody, scream. Look at your neighbor and say it's my recovery season. Look at your neighbor, say beauty, for ashes, the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. Is there anybody here who can declare it? Say, neighbor, I used to be bent over. I used to be bent down, but God came into my room. Now I'm in my recovery season. If I'm talking to you, shout yes, shout yes, shout yes. Shout yes, now scream. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, everything the devil tried to steal from you, God is giving it back to you. If you believe it, shout glory. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Say three people high five, say look at me, I'm in recovery, I'm in recovery, I'm in recovery. I'm getting my worship back. I'm getting my praise back. I'm getting my faith back. I'm getting my anointing back. Is there anybody here who's in recovery? Come on, give God the praise. Come on, give God the glory. Come on, give God the honor. I need about four people to walk into your recovery. Excuse yourself from where you are and walk into your recovery. Walk into your recovery. Walk into your recovery. Walk into your recovery. I don't look the same that I used to look. I don't look the same that I used to sound, but I'm in recovery. If you're in recovery, lift your hands. If you're in recovery, walk out in the aisles and declare, my recovery has begun. My recovery has begun. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor, you don't look like what you've been through. You don't sound like what you've been through. Why? Because Jesus has always been in my room. He's 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 in my room. If he's in your room, shout yes. If he's in your room, shout yes. If he's in your room, give him the glory. The Bible says in Mark 5:42 that the girl stood up and began to walk around. Look at your name and say, everybody was astonished. If you're in the room, I need you to stand up. And even if you don't leave your seat, just walk around. Just walk around. Just walk around, 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 and as you're walking around, recite the promises that every place my feet shall trod, he is given to me. I need about four more people to help us walk around, help us walk around, help us walk around, help us walk around, walk around, walk around, walk around. They're astonished. They thought you'd never walk again. They thought you'd never love again. They thought you'd never church again. But they were wrong because all the time you and I were in the room with the Most High God. Shout yes, shout yes, shout yes, shout yes, 
Now scream! Touch somebody, say neighbor. He's in the room. Say neighbor. He's in the room. Tell somebody, I'm in the room. He's in the room. We're all in the room. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, my last room is the recovery room. Now that I'm discharged, I'm walking out in the power of the room. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, praise team. He's in the room. Come on, y'all. Oh, he's in the room. Come on, church, put a phrase on it. What you say? Oh, oh he's in the room. Woo. Yes, he is. Say yes, what? Say what? Is. Oh, he's in the room. He's in the room. He's in the room. He's in the room. Jesus is in the room. Come on, lift your voice and shout, oh! Oh, 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 he's in the room. Woo! I need you to lift your voice again, come on! Oh, 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 he's in the room. I need you to lift one more time for the Holy Ghost, come on! Anybody here who knows that the power of the Most High God is right here in the room? Come on and give God the praise, give God the glory, and shout! Stay right there, stay right there. We're gonna let them sing this thing in one minute, but let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you how the story ends. In verse 43, it said Jesus gave them strict orders that no one was to know what had taken place in the room. Understand, beloved, one possible interpretation of this is that you don't have to feel the need to report to everyone about what occurred in the room with Jesus to people that got dismissed from the room because they don't want to know, they just want to gossip. You don't have to tell them because guess what? Your life after the recovery room is proof positive that something happened in the room. Sing. Oh, 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 he's in the room. Come on, lift that again. Lift that again. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, 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 he's in the room. Woo! Come on, third time, third time. Come on. say neighbor guess what Jesus works differently in everybody's room he works in your room one way he works in my room another way but here's the shout neighbor he's at work in all our rooms say what say what oh, 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 he's in the room. come on lift your voice lift your voice lift your voice come on Break it down, break it down. So listen, listen. He doesn't want us to become methodological as we expect our room to be an exactly duplicate of somebody else's room. But just know that the things that happen whenever and wherever happen in your room can also happen in my room in a personal way. Sing it. Come on, lift your voice, lift your voice. Say what? One more time, one more time. Break it down, break it down. When people who 
have been in a room with Jesus get deposited into any situation. The Jesus that is in us through the person of the Holy Spirit will use us to change that room. In Acts chapter 9, Dorcas and Tabitha died. But because Peter had been in the room with Jesus, Peter brought Dorcas back to life. Later on, Tabitha died. And because Paul had been in the room with Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul brought Tabitha back to life. And he said, little girl, get up. He said what Jesus said. So what you're saying, Flo, what I'm saying is that people who've been in a room with Jesus, when we get deposited to any situation, we will change the room. Elbow, somebody say we're going to change the room. Oh, he's in the room. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, he's in the room. Come on, come on. Bring it from your belly. Come on, come on, come on, three more times, come on. Oh, he's in the room. Whoa. Anybody feel him in the room this morning? Anybody feel him in the room this morning? Oh, he's in the room. Woo! Say what, what y'all say? Oh, he's in the room. If you feel God in this room, I need you to lift your hands and give him your 30 seconds of your best praise, of your best worship, of your most excited glory. Come on, give it to him for about 30 seconds because not only is he in this physical room, but he's in these rooms. If you feel him in the room, give him the glory. If you feel him in the room, give him the honor. If you feel him in the room, give him the majesty. Woo! Find your neighbor, find your neighbor, serenade your neighbor, serenade. Oh, 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 oh. Find another neighbor. Go ahead and serenade him. Go ahead and serenade him. Oh, 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 oh. Now make it personal. He's in my room. He's in my room. Oh, 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 oh. He's in my room. Woo! Come on, make it personal. Oh, 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 he's in my room. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, 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 he's in my room. Lift it this time, a cappella, a cappella. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, 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 he's in my room. Woo! Last time, come on. Come on, put a praise on it. Come on, put a praise on it. Come on, put a praise on it. He's in the room. 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 If you believe it, lift your hands. If you believe it, stomp your feet. If you believe it, open your mouth. And give God 35 seconds of your best praise. Because he's in the room. Because he's in the room. Because he's in the room. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Let's lift our voice in the room. In the room. In the room. Somebody. Anybody. Everybody. Scream.